Well, we have been in our Summer on the Mount series. Pastor Chris has been taking us through uh, Matthew chapter 5, and, and the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5 through 8. It's really Jesus's first extended section of teaching. And so Jesus, he's been doing miracles, and they're gaining notoriety, and people are learning about him. And so he says, you know what, I want to sit down, and I want to teach people what the kingdom of God really is, and how it really works, and what it really looks like to follow me. And so that's what he does in Matthew chapter 5 through 8. And we're still in the first part of Matthew chapter 5. We've been in what's called the Beatitudes, the first 10 or so verses in Matthew chapter 5. And really, it's, it's Jesus describing what it looks like to be a person in the kingdom of God and what it looks like to live that way in those character traits and those sorts of things. And so Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says, One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them And this is what he says. These are the Beatitudes. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. He's saying God blesses those people who who know that no matter how much earthly possessions, earthly success, promotion, influence, whatever they find on this earth, they still have a, a recognition of their need for God and of a Savior and the salvation that he offers. He's saying God blesses those who realize that and don't get caught up in everything else. He continues in verse 4, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Isn't it nice to know that God doesn't run from our pain or run from our mourning, but he's right there in the midst of it with us, and it doesn't have to be everything is going well all the time to experience God, but he comforts us right in the middle of that. He continues, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. We like to skip over that one because humility is not super easy, um, but he calls us to it. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. And it's easy to look around and and see a lot of the injustice in this world and wonder when when that hunger and thirst for justice will be satisfied and, and wonder where God's at and what he's doing. But he makes us a promise. If we hunger and thirst for justice, we will be satisfied and we will see it. The problem is it's in his timing and not our own timing. So we must just continue in that. Pastor Chris last week took us through verse 7 and 8. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We talked about the radical mercy that we've experienced from God and how now, in light of that, that's how we should operate with other people and extend that radical mercy that we didn't deserve in the first place and that other people probably don't deserve either, but we've received it, and so we should give it. And then God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Today we will be in verse 9. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And then next week, Pastor Chris wrapped up in verse 10. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And so we're going to, like I said, verse 9, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. So we're going to talk about being peacemakers today, being peacemakers. And so the first thing you need to know about peacemaking, number one, peacemaking is work. Peacemaking is work. He, he's phrased it that way for a reason. God blesses those who work for peace. Notice he didn't say God blesses those who have a peaceful life, where everything's going well for, everything's quiet on the home front, right? Nothing's rocking the boat too much. No, he's saying God blesses those who work for peace, who put forth the effort, see the necessity for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Peacemaking is not peacekeeping. Okay, that's an important distinction that we have to make because peacekeeping is keeping quiet, going along to get along, not rocking the boat, right? Everything seems okay, so we're just going to ride along with it. We know there's some, some stuff going on behind the scenes, but we're just going to act like it's not happening because it's not really affecting us right now. We're just going to keep rolling. That's not peacemaking. That's peacekeeping. But peacemaking is not passive. It's not tolerant. And it's not quiet. When it sees something that needs to be addressed... It addresses it in love. It addresses it, but it addresses it in love, and it's not quiet. It doesn't just hope that it's going to ignore it, put the blinders on, and everything's going to work out, but it addresses it. Peacemaking is active. Peacemaking is hard work. The unfortunate truth is that peacemaking is often uncomfortable. Why? Because it, it involves us making peace and having conversations with other people. we probably rather not have conversations with or conversations we're not comfortable having. But peacemaking is necessary. And you'll definitely see why by the end of this message. But it's necessary because Jesus said, blessed are the peace, those who work for peace. And if he's detailing what the kingdom of God looks like and what it looks like to follow him, 
Sounds pretty necessary to me if we're going to follow Jesus, that we must work for peace. So we're going to go through a couple of things of what peacemakers don't do, and then we're going to discuss what peacemakers do. And so the first thing that peacemakers don't do is peacemakers don't gossip. Peacemakers don't gossip, either out of anger. Oftentimes we get angry with somebody, so you're like, you know what, I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind and say everything. But oftentimes we're vending to somebody else and coloring their perception of that person just because we're angry, right? But we're not called to do that, as Pastor Chris showed us last week. We're called to extend that same radical mercy that we didn't deserve that Jesus showed us to other people. And just as we've received, so we shall give. We either gossip out of anger or subconsciously a lot of times we gossip out of insecurity because we're really insecure about some stuff in our life and we see other people getting ahead of us, so we gotta make sure other people know that they're not really all they're cracked up to be, right? We know some stuff that if they only knew, they wouldn't be so chummy with that person, right? So we feel like, I'm just doing them, I'm warning them ahead of time, I'm doing them a favor. When that other person's trying to work past the mess that you and them created in their past and you just keep bringing it up because you're insecure about where you're at. We don't often do it on purpose, right? But we have to be careful not to do that because peacemakers don't gossip. Often what that looks like in our day, in our age, in our generation is it plays out on social media, right? And, and either we're, we're venting and we're angry and we're tagging everybody and their mama in that post on Facebook and telling everybody just what we think of them, or we're being a little more subtle and we're doing what we used to call it when I was in high school, subtweeting somebody, which is just, oh, I'm just going to I feel like the Lord wants me to share about an issue on my heart and I just need to bring attention to it on Facebook and everybody else knows who you're talking about and they know you're talking about them and, and we're just doing it under the guise of, I'm just trying to bring attention and make people aware, but we're airing our dirty laundry on Facebook and we're really just not bold enough to tag them. I'm not saying be bold and tag people on Facebook. <laughs> What I'm saying is, instead of airing our dirty laundry for everybody, how about we take it to Jesus and let him wash it in in secret and make up with people instead of giving the church another black eye? That's what I'm saying. So peacemakers don't gossip. And James, if you've read the book of James, you know, he's pretty hard line in some of the ways that he goes about things. And so in James chapter 1, verse 26, he says this, If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. I don't know how much more like obvious he can be or how much more plain he can be, but he's, he's really hitting us there. He says, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. But he gives us the win. He gives us what to do. He says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. We have to come to a place where we're going to decide that no matter what's going on around us, what's breaking loose, what other people are saying about us, what's happening, what's not happening, that we're not going to let the world corrupt us on the inside, what Jesus is doing on the inside because of what's going on on the outside. And then in our anger and in our temper or in our insecurity, we go about tearing everybody down, causing division, and really just making the church and Christianity and Jesus look worse than some of us have already made him look in the past several years, right? And so peacemakers don't gossip, but instead They're busy taking care of people. They're busy doing what Jesus called them to do, taking care of orphans and widows and letting the world, not letting the world corrupt them. So peacemakers don't gossip. Second thing peacemakers don't do is peacemakers don't excuse division. Peacemakers don't excuse division. I thought cause division was a little obvious um, if we're trying to make peace, but there's something that's a little less obvious in excusing division or tolerating division by saying that's just the way it is, that's just the way it'll always be, or feeling like we have a right to tolerate it. But I put it this way in my notes. Division tolerated is self-destruction activated. And I said that because immediately I had this thought in my mind, right, of every action movie, cartoon or otherwise, where these two guys who really don't like each other, they have to come together to save the world, right, even though they don't really want to, and now they're at the end, and the clock's ticking down, but then they start fighting, right, in the control room, and they push, one of them pushes the other one, he hits the self-destruct button, it's like, oh gosh, now what, now the clock's even ticking down even more, and that's what I thought about, and those are sometimes silly scenes, but at the same time, it's what we do. When we begin fighting with each other, we lose focus on the mission, right? The goal that Jesus has called us to, to win the world for him, to help him save the world. And instead, we're smashing the self-destruct button every five minutes because we're excusing division and we can't get along with anybody. 
I get the privilege of traveling around a little bit and promoting SUM Bible College, which we have here at the church. We have several students. We just graduated three students a few weeks ago, if you were here for that ceremony. And I get to go and I share it with youth pastors and youth students, young adults who feel called to ministry or, or pastors who are already ministering, but they want to learn more and grow more and get their degree. I get to share that with them. And so I was doing that at youth camp a few weeks ago and catching up with a youth pastor that I know. And he was telling me about their parish is one of the more rural parishes we have in the state, one of the smaller parishes. But they have over 100 churches in their small rural parish. And at first you're like, man, that's awesome. They must be really spiritual. But then he told me that 80% of them are results of church splits. And so now you've got 100 churches of 25 to 50 people that, that are ineffective because they can't get along with anybody else. And they're not reaching their community. But everybody knows how divisive and angry those, those church people are in our parish. So they don't even want anything to do with them because we excuse division and we can't get along with anybody. That's not what we're called to do. I believe when Jesus sees that, I believe he's, his heart hurts because that's not what he exemplified for us. That's not what he showed us, but he showed us how to love our enemies. Speaking of, we don't really have enemies. We have, there's one enemy, right? His name's Lucifer, and he's come to steal, kill, and destroy, but everybody else is just somebody else that God's put in our path that we can show his love to, that we can show his joy, his hope, his peace, his grace to. They're not really our enemy. Maybe they're just having a bad day, or we're having a bad day, and we're taking it out on them and wondering why they're taking it out on us. We don't have enemies, right? All the people who aren't in the church, who don't love Jesus, all they are is just a future brother and sister in Christ. If you look at it that way, then how can we be mad at them? How can we take it out on them? Penn Jillette said this. He said, he's a famous atheist, famous magician. He said, if I was a Christian and I believed I had the key to eternal life and salvation, how much would I hate somebody to not tell them about it? And we don't often think of it that way, right? We're just going about our life. But if we truly love people, come on, we got to share what we have. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He also says it this way in Romans chapter 16. He says, and now I'll make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause division and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. This is the point I wanted us to notice right here. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. And so many times, as I kind of shared a little bit of an example, we're, we're warning people about that other person, right? I just need to let you know before you really get too close to that person, right? We sound like we're doing them a favor, but really we're just tearing somebody else down. And maybe God has something for that relationship for both of them, and you just destroyed it because you're not letting God work, and we're excusing division or we're gossiping, we're tearing other people down. And it's not always the obvious things, right? Sometimes it's subtle, smooth talk, glowing words. But we can't excuse division in any of its forms. We must take a stand against that. So peacemakers don't gossip. They don't excuse division. The third and final thing that peacemakers don't do is peacemakers don't stay silent. Peacemakers don't stay silent. And here's the other part. Peacemakers don't get to pick and choose which issues and agendas they stay silent or don't stay silent on. When I was in Bible college and, and, and researching church history, you really see where the church had an opportunity in a lot of ways in the 60s and 70s to really do even more than they did on the civil rights movement. But a lot of a lot of leaders were afraid of, of how they would look or how they would be received if they said something. But now, those same ones I read about staying silent then, now are all loud about other issues like pro-life and Roe v. Wade. And what I'm saying here, I'm not saying one's right or the other one's wrong. What I'm saying is we're called to speak up in all issues, right? If Jesus said it, then we've got we to take a stand for it. We don't get to pick and choose which ones we're more comfortable with. Just because we know more about it or because it's affecting us. We don't get to pick and choose and stay silent on anything, but Jesus has given us a voice and we must use the influence that we have. We read the scripture that says we, we must hunger and thirst for justice and we will be satisfied. But then we talk about the scripture in Genesis. We've seen this all the way since the beginning. When Eve was being tempted by the serpent, right? We always, <sighs> Eve, that woman, you know, she just, she couldn't resist the temptation. But really, Adam's standing there the whole time and didn't say nothing. He's standing there the whole time seeing what's taking place, and he's not stepping up. He's not saying anything. And the good news is 
that the Bible says, just as the whole world was cast into darkness through one Adam, so the whole world may be saved through the new Adam, whose name is Jesus. Come on, and we have an opportunity, not just to speak up like Adam had and tell them what not to do, but now Jesus has come. We have an opportunity to speak up and share with them a hope, share with them a life, share with them joy and peace and love and everything that Jesus came and has given us and offers to us. We have the opportunity to speak up and share that. But so many times we stay silent because it's maybe easier, more comfortable. It's, it's not as challenging right? But we don't have the option to stay silent. James 4, 17 says this. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's a little bit of an expansion of what we think sin is, right? Because for the most part, sin is don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, right? We have a list. As long as we're hitting that list, we're pretty good. James is like, if you know what you should do and don't do it, you might as well sin. That's basically the same thing. So we don't have an option to stay silent. Because we know the truth. Well, we know Jesus. We know what he offers. We have the opportunity. And when we stay silent, we might as well join in on the sin. Because James is saying it's the same thing. So we've got to speak up. We've got to follow Jesus' example. Jesus spoke on things and spoke up, especially when it wasn't easy. It cost him his life. Speaking up. And I don't think any of us are in danger of losing our life for speaking up here in America anyway but yet we still stay silent. But peacemakers don't stay silent. We say something. We step up. So peacemakers don't gossip, excuse division, or stay silent. So what do peacemakers do? If I don't do all of those things, what should I be doing? Well, peacemakers do, first of all, peacemakers stand for the weak. Peacemakers stand for the weak. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 40, Jesus is telling a parable to the Pharisees, and, and he's saying this, and the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, and that's not political, Jesus is just saying, I'm turning to people, he's going to turn to people on his left, right? And just Let's get out of that mindset, Jesus is just telling a story. I'll turn, he will, the king will turn to the people on his left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Listen to this. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me to your home. I was naked, you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit, visit me. Watch their response. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and not help you. They're like, God, if I saw you needing something, I'm stepping up, you know? I love you, God. I'm, if I saw you need, if you, if you needed me to take care of you, if you need me to feed you, give you something to drink, take care of you while you're sick, get you out of prison, I'm there, God. I would have, if we saw you, we'd have done something. We just didn't see you. And he says, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. Because oftentimes we pick and choose who we're willing to go the second mile for. Oftentimes we pick and choose who we're willing to extend a little more grace to than other people. And we have a little more patience with certain people. But Jesus is saying, it's simple. Sometimes we complicate this thing, right? But you're saying it's simple. If you see somebody who needs something, take care of them. If you see somebody who's hungry, feed them. If you see somebody who's thirsty, give them something to drink. And here's the kicker. If we're not so caught up in what we need and we're focused on everybody else's needs and everybody else is doing the same, then somebody else is going to see our need and take care of it, right? But if we're so focused on and everybody's focused on me, 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 then we don't, we don't reach out to anybody else, and nobody's reaching out to us, and we're all just sitting around having needs, and we're trying to take care of them ourselves, and everybody's dying alone. But Jesus is saying, if you see somebody who needs something, do something about it. Stand up for the weak. Stand up for those who don't have a voice. Stand up for those who feel oppressed. Stand up for those who feel like they don't have a place to belong. Let them know they belong with you. If you feel like you don't have a place to belong, I'll tell you this. Here at New Hope, you have a place to belong. It doesn't matter where you're from, where you've been, what you've done. You belong here, and we're glad that you're here, and we want you here, a part of our family. So peacemakers stand for the weak. What else do peacemakers do? Peacemakers fight for unity. Peacemakers fight for unity. Unity does not happen passively, but it is actively cultivated and consistently maintained. Think about 
somebody you butt heads with at work. You're probably not expecting to just wake up Tuesday morning and go into work and all of a sudden y'all are best friends and everything's hunky-dory and you're all getting along, right? No, that takes work. Same thing it does in our families. Same thing it does with, with close relationships and relationships at work. It takes work. We must fight for unity. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter four Paul says this, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Notice last week, side note, Pastor Chris talked about what gets us, what dirties our hearts sometimes and, and, and gets rid of our pure heart that Jesus made pure is comparison. And so we're not supposed to be comparing ourselves to everybody else and trying to be like everybody else. But there is one we should be comparing ourselves against, and that's Jesus, because he set the example. And if we're measuring up to Jesus and we really see how far we really have to go, then maybe we'll have a little bit more grace for everybody else, and we'll actually be honest with ourselves about where we're at and let Jesus work in us. So he's saying, do measure yourself against Jesus, that standard. Why? He says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. But instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. Focus on this part. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And we've heard this analogy a million times, right? The church is a body. It has many different parts, and we all have to get along to be together. Well, the same yesterday is still true today. And we're all one body, and we all have to get along. Sure, we can, we can get along without certain parts of the body, right? I mean, there's people who do it every day who have, you know, different, different issues, different things, and they're still living a great life and getting along. But as the church, if we're not coming together in unity, working with one another, and we've got parts going every different direction, then we're just going to stay stuck and not accomplish and be efficient the way that that God really wants us to. And there's some things that God wants to do. That parish I mentioned, you don't think there's some things God wants to do in that parish? In those people's lives, in those homes? Just because they don't live in a bigger city doesn't mean that, that God doesn't have something for them, but because they're all so preoccupied with fighting with one another and splitting churches and taking their ball and going home, there's people not being reached. And so we have to actively fight for unity. We have to actively think in our mind, is this leading to greater division, or is this bringing me closer to somebody else? Is this helping the church? Is this helping that person or hurting? We must actively fight for those things. So how do we do that? Through relationships and conversation. And conversation usually follows relationships. Why is that so hard? Because those things require humility and selflessness. And we're not great at either one of those things. Right? And our culture and our world that's follow your heart, do what feels right, do what makes you happy. We're not used to denying ourselves, looking outside of ourselves, humbling ourselves, and reaching out across the table and talking to somebody else and building a relationship with somebody. We say this all the time. Your relationship with someone isn't like a real solid relationship until you go through something together, until there's a problem in the relationship and you overcome it. Then there's a solidity in that relationship, right? Think about the people that you've known for 20, 30 years. You've been through everything together. You don't question that relationship. And you have a little bit more grace and tolerance for that person, don't you? Yeah. But the people we don't know, it's easy to vilify them in our mind and make them out to something that they're not because we don't know them. And we don't know the intention of their heart. We don't know how they were raised. We don't know what's going on in their mind. But because we never have a conversation and reach out, we don't know. We don't know. And so we stay divided the entire time. So we must... Work in humility and selflessness to build relationships and fight for unity. Third thing that peacemakers do is defend the truth. Peacemakers defend the truth. Here, not his truth or her truth, but God's truth, right? There is one truth that presides over all, and it is the word of God, and it is what God has spoken since the beginning of time, and that is what we must defend even if, especially if, it's an uncomfortable truth. Because a lot of times the truth is a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes a lot of bit uncomfortable. But those are the ones that are so necessary. Those are the ones where we get caught up and comfortable in areas that, that maybe we don't know the truth, 
because we haven't discovered it or we haven't been taught it, or we're comfortable, but we're missing God in an area because we don't know the truth. So before we ever defend the truth, we gotta know the truth. And this is what Jesus says, this is what Jesus prays in John chapter 17. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Listen to this. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and they may be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. You want people to believe in Jesus? Know the truth, let the truth make us holy, and then live in unity with one another. And Jesus says, and the world will believe that you sent me. But it starts with knowing the truth and then defending the truth. There are gonna be moments where you have to take a stand for what God's word says in love. It's never okay to beat people over the head with the Bible, right? And turn that thing into a, a sledgehammer or a weapon. But it says that the word of God is like a sword. And sometimes it does a little bit of cutting away of some things that don't belong there. But we have to defend the truth. We have to step up. And that starts with not staying silent, right? If we're staying silent and then we try to speak up and defend the truth in another area, people don't want to hear it because you were silent on this other issue. Where were you whenever I needed you to speak up on this? Now you want to talk because it's something you're comfortable with? We have to speak up all the time on all the truth. We have to defend God's truth no matter the circumstances. And the fourth thing that peacemakers do is love fiercely. I, I put at first love recklessly, love relentlessly, but I, I felt like fiercely kind of encompassed all those things I was thinking. But, but we are called to love others fiercely. First Corinthians chapter 13, Paul has just finished an entire chapter on, on the cool stuff, right? The spiritual gifts and how to operate in the kingdom and what God's calling you to do and, and all that kind of stuff. And then he follows all of that up with saying this in first Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I stood up here with my Bible college degree and everything that I've learned and my years pastoring and, and, and did all kinds of things and, and Pastor Chris and the rest of the staff and the church did all sorts of stuff, but we didn't love people and people didn't feel loved here and people didn't feel accepted here and people didn't see love in us, Paul says we're just making a bunch of noise. We're just noisy. We're just adding to the confusion. Paul says, if I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Come on, we want to see God move mountains and then we want to see people believe in it, right? But he's saying if we get to the point where God begins moving mountains in our life, nobody else is going to care because they don't know that you love them because you didn't love them. Or maybe the opposite, you showed the opposite of love to them. So why would they care? We want to go and share what Jesus has done in us. And everybody's like, man, you don't love, why are you telling me this? You don't love me. You don't care about me. Why do I need that if I got to deal with this? I have, a, I have a really funny story I want to share that. I promise in the middle of it, you can be like, where's this going? But it's got a point, I promise. And I have to tell it today because I told it to Pastor Chris and he wanted to use it, so I had to use it before he could. So I was at youth camp a couple of weeks ago, like I said, promoting for SUM. And, um, and the speaker there, his name was Jeremy Donovan for that week. And he's from Philadelphia and he was raised in the home of a pastor. His dad was a pastor. And when he's nine or 10 years old, he's wanting a pet, right? Like every kid does at some point, but his parents didn't want a dog or cat, something a little bigger, more expensive. They said, you get something, fits in the cage, you can keep it in the basement, you know, that kind of thing. So they go to the pet store, he's walking around and he gets to the section with the rodents. And he finds these little 99 cent rats. And he's like, man, a rat would be cool. And so he's looking and he finds this little rat in the corner, curled up with his hands folded like this in front of him. He's like, that's my rat right there. My rat's praying. He'd been praying for me. My dad's a pastor. We love Jesus. That's a spiritual rat right there. I'm taking him home. So his parents, his parents actually say, you know what? If you want a 99 cent rat, you can have the rat. So he gets the rat, takes it home. He's got a little cage for it, puts it in his basement. He loves that rat so much. And he, he tells the story as, as, as the rat continued to grow, he realized that one of its legs were deformed. And so he, one of his legs isn't growing right. And so of course, nine, 10 years old, he's, he loves his rat so much. He wants, 
He's praying, God, heal my rat, fix my rat, do something for my rat. And so in the midst of all of this, he goes to church one Sunday and he hears his dad tell a story about a man named Smith Wigglesworth. Now, some of these stories with, with Wigglesworth over the decades, the family has even come out and said has been a little stretched, a little embellished, a little exaggerated as people tend to do, right? But what was undeniable is that he really was an evangelist in the early 1900s that really saw God do a lot of miracles. So as the story went for this pastor, he had heard the story this way, that Smith was preaching a revival and these parents had lost a child. And they brought him to the pastor because they didn't know what else to do. And so they bring him to him and he takes the child in the middle of, in front of all of these people in this room. And, and he says, God told him to do this. I mean, God would have to come down in a cloud in person to tell me to do this before I ever did this. He said he felt like the Lord told him to throw the baby at the wall and command it to live. So he does, and, and the first time he does it, the baby doesn't live. So he does it a second time, and the story goes, the baby came back to life, everybody's celebrating, doing the whole thing. Kind of a cool story, kind of strange. Not really sure about that one, but that's what the story he's hearing, right? So as a little kid, he's like, I've been praying for God to show me something. This is it. <laughs> so, he said, so he goes home, he runs down to his basement, he's like, Radicus, today is the day you are being healed. He reaches in his cage, he pulls him out. He says, in the name of Jesus, Radicus, I command your leg to grow and flings this rat at the wall, right? <laughs> so he walks over his rat, his rat's probably like got a concussion laying on the floor, you know? Picks up his rat and his leg didn't grow. He's like, he did it twice. <laughs> so he backs up again, he says, Radicus, in the name of Jesus, your leg will grow and he chucks the rat at the wall. And unfortunately, Radicus's leg didn't grow. So now Radek is like, I thought you loved me, man. I don't know what you're doing to me. So he puts him back in his cage, and in a couple of weeks, they go on vacation, right? And about a week into their vacation, they're going to be gone for a couple of weeks, he realizes, Mom, I didn't get anybody to feed Radicus. So she's like, well, buddy, there's not much we can do right now. When we get home, you know, we'll see where he's at. So he gets home. He runs down to the basement after a couple of weeks, and he finds Radicus just like he always is, curled up in the corner praying. But this time, he's cold and stiff and praying. And he said, man, he was just probably praying for me to feed him. So he said, and then I, it dawned on me, this is the miracle God wanted to work. <laughs> so he grabs his rat again, and he walks out, and he says, Radicus, in the name of Jesus, I command you to live, and flings his rat at the wall, this time leaving a dent in the paneling with how hard he threw it. So he picks it up, and of course, Radicus isn't alive. So he remembers again, he did it twice. 10-year-old ten year old Jeremy got so much faith, so little sense, and he grabs that rat, and he says, in the name of Jesus, I command you, and throws him again. Of course, Radicus doesn't come back to life. And so he tells a story. Of course, the kids are laughing, and he used it from a different perspective, a different point, but it really dawned on me what we've been talking about. There are people that we love so much that we want to fix, but instead of loving them and just simply feeding them and taking care of them like Radicus wanted them to do, we're taking them and we're bashing them against the wall and we're trying to fix them and trying to make them how we want them to be. And the whole time they just want you to feed them and love them and care for them. And we have kids in our community. It's no secret. We have kids in our community taking each other's lives every day and we want to come down on them and blame them and vilify them, but we haven't lived it out for them. We haven't given them an example to follow. We haven't loved them. We've just told them where they're missing it. And the whole time, they just want somebody to love them and feed them and take care of them or just bashing them against the wall. But we have an opportunity. Jesus says, follow me, pick up your cross. And as we love people, his word says, others will know you by the love that you have for one another. We want to see people be fixed. We want to see our community transformed. Then let's love them how Jesus loves them. Let's love them how Jesus loves us. Come on, you know the grace and the mercy you've experienced you don't deserve. Let's show that to somebody else. And everything else, let it take care of itself. Let's, let's love them to Jesus first and then let Jesus fix some things on the inside of them. Let's live it out for people. But at the same time, we're so divided and quarreling and arguing and, and not speaking up on this and speaking up too much on this. And let's love people, man. Let's love people fiercely. Let's see our community change. Here's the win, right? I've, message has been a little challenging, a little heavy, but here's the win. Number two, 
Peacemaking is work. Peacemaking produces righteousness. Here's the, here's the reward for all the hard work of peacemaking. James chapter 3. Here's James again. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And listen to this. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. We want to see righteousness? Come on, we want to see people live righteous lives and, and be fixed? Come on, let's, let's make peace. Let's build bridges with other people. Hebrews 12 says this. Work at living in peace with, with everyone. Work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. But look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Come on, we have an opportunity to love people. Yeah, Jesus is calling us to it and it's necessary and it's, it's a responsibility. But it's an opportunity to make peace with people and build bridges, not walls. Build inroads in other parts of the community. Love people that need to be loved. Jesus made it so simple. Feed them. Clothe them. Give them something to drink. Take care of them. Invite them in your home and make them feel welcome like they have a place to belong. And let's love others fiercely.